ready to give God praise tonight? Come on, let's give the Lord some praise tonight. Stand to your feet and let's sing this song. As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, till we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace. And only bow down and say, You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, I'm a father. You are worthy of all praise. To you, our lives we raise. You are awesome. In this place, mighty God, you are awesome in this place, mighty God, you are awesome in this place, of a Father, you are worthy of all praise, to you our lives we raise, you are awesome. In this place, mighty God. When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how He picked me up and turned me around, how He placed my feet on solid ground, it makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you Jesus, Lord you're worthy of all of the glory. All of the honor and all of the praise makes me want to shout, Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory, all the honor and all the praise. When I think about the Lord, me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground. It makes me want to shout, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory, all the honor and all the praise. It makes me want to shout, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory. All of the honor and all the praise. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Can you feel his mighty power and his grace? Presence 
of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. So oh, I can hear the rush of angels' wings. I see the Lord. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father God, we just thank you for this day that you've given us, God. We thank you for... Each and every day, it's truly a gift, Lord, to walk with your presence, your power, and your spirit living in us. God, as we come together tonight, Lord, we just want to experience you and your power and your presence, God. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us tonight, Lord, that you touch each and every person here, God, whatever the need, whether it be great or small, God, we know you're able to do all things, and Lord, we thank you for that tonight. So God, we ask that you would be with us tonight as we open your word and we study your word, God. Lord, that you would just speak to each one of us, Lord, that we might hear you very, very clearly, God, that we would hear exactly what you would want us to hear, Lord, that we'd have hearts open to hear. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your presence and your power. We thank you for your touch, God. Lord, we pray for those that are sick, God, those that are not well. Lord, we ask that you would touch each and every one of them, Lord, Lord, because we know that you are the healer. So, God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for everything. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Amen. So I reckon we need to do a few little announcements here, right? Regular services, Sunday morning, we're going to have um, um, communion during the worship service. It's going to be an awesome time. Amen. It's always a good time when we come together to worship God, and especially when we celebrate communion. So we're looking forward to that. We're also looking forward to send off our missionaries on Sunday morning, praise God. They're leaving the 26th, so uh, definitely be in prayer for them. But we're also we're going um, to send them off on Sunday morning um, with, with uh, the blessing of the church, and that's going to be exciting. Um, we're just looking forward to good things. Remember, we're going to have a watch night service on New Year's Eve which is another, what, a week and a half away, at 10 p.m. We're going to start with a baptismal service. We're going to do some baptisms, and then we're going to go ahead and have some food and some fellowship. And I guess we may even have a live feed from R Rwanda, right? We're going to try to work on that and see if we can't get a, get a live feed here on New Year's Eve while they're over in Africa that they're going to try to, uh, you know, greet us, I guess. I'm not sure how this is going to work, but we'll... Uh, We'll see. We can work it out. It's only half a world away, but I'm sure we can figure it out somehow. Praise God. So we're excited about that. Keep all those things in mind as you go through your days um, ahead. If I could, if I could go ahead and get the ushers to come forward for the offering this evening, and then we'll go ahead and, and get in the Word of God tonight. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you for this day that you've given us, God. And we thank you for your provision in our lives. God, you are so good to us. Day in and day out, Lord, you provide. God, when we need, Lord, you know it. And you provide for your children. Lord, we thank you for that. So, Lord, we ask as we give tonight, Lord, toward missions, God, we ask that you would take each and every dollar that's given, Lord, and that you would use it and multiply it. Lord, bless the gift and the giver. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
you. I got a I got a crook in my neck or a crick in my neck, whatever you want to call it. So y'all be praying for my neck. I'm gonna tell you now. It's just yeah, absolutely. Y'all just just pray that my neck gets straightened out. I'm telling you, that's that's tough when you got a crook in your neck. Hebrews chapter six. We go ahead and get on in there a little bit. Last week we got into some of the some of the heavier and weightier issues issues of um, Hebrews chapter six. And, and now we're going to go on even further. The beautiful thing about the book of Hebrews is it talks about how Christ is better than everything. Amen? He's better than anything and everything. He's the great I am. He's awesome. He's powerful. He is the high priest. He's a prophet, a priest, and a king. He's all the above. He's everything we need. He's our all in all. And so as you read Hebrews, the, the argument is being made throughout the whole book that you don't need to go back to the Jewish law because you have the fulfillment of the law, and his name's Jesus Christ. And that's where you need to be. And so we need, we need to absolutely remember that the whole time as we, as we go through Hebrews that they're always making a case for Christ. The whole book, if you go through over and over and over again, it's making the case why Jesus is better, why Jesus is greater, why Jesus is higher, why Jesus is more awesome. And that's an awesome thing about the book of Hebrews, that it's all about Jesus. Everywhere you look in here, it's going to point to the Messiah. And so we're, we're just, um, you know, I, I just love I love this book. It's really good. I'm learning a lot as I study because, see, I have to teach you all in order for me to, to teach you. i got to teach myself, right? I mean, that's the way it works. When you, well, anytime you have to teach, why, you have to actually um, teach yourself along the way to make sure that you understand in order to be able to teach. So we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 13. And I'm going to go ahead and read about seven verses, and then we'll break it all down and, and go from there and, and kind of get in there and chew on this. This book is so full of... Um, of wisdom and knowledge, and, and we, need, we really need to, uh, to, to savor it and, and go through it um, in a way to where we can just uh, savor every morsel. So it tells us in chapter 6, starting in verse 13, it says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. We, um, that is an absolute mouthful right there. Is it not? I mean, when I read through like that, I don't understand a word. All I understood was Melchizedek, because that was the last thing I said. Other than that, I, I, don't, I don't get it. So I've got, you've got to slow it down. You have to take, take the Word of God out and you have to savor it. You have to, you have to break it up. You have to let it soak in. There's a lot of ways that we can study the Word of God. One way that you can allow the Spirit of God to speak to you, and I don't know, some of you may do this already, but if you'll just take a couple verses every day and just read them out loud and just meditate on it and allow God to speak to you what he wants you to know or hear through those words. And just let it, you know, just read it out loud. Because there's something about, about the word of God being read out loud that it, it, it ministers to us. And it just, it just, you know, and God brings things to our, to our knowledge um, through it. So I want to go ahead and start in verse 13. Um, it tells us in verse 13, it says, For when God made a promise to Abraham. I, I want, you to, want you to think about the promise. It said, Surely blessing I will um, um, bless you, and, and multiplying, I will multiply you. God made a promise to Abraham. I mean, that was, that was a promise that he made to him. He said that his, his, his ancestor, his, his seed was going to be greater than, than the stars that he could see in the heavens. This was an incredible, incredible promise that he made to Abraham. But I want you to understand that, that this promise that he made, it was not only to Abraham, but also to all of us. As his seed, we're heirs and we're part of the promise. See, a lot of times we don't realize that we're part of the promise. That's what you need to say. You need to tell yourself that. I am part of the promise. 
See, a lot of times we think that we don't, we don't have any inheritance or we don't have anything going for us. I'm here to tell you that as children of Abraham, spiritual children for sure, we are part of the promise. God told Abraham, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. That he was just going to absolutely bless this man. And I want you to understand this, that, that there was a promise made. God made the promise, but not only did he make the promise to Abraham, but he swore about that promise. That it was going to be, be true. That it, that it was something that God swore that this promise would be true. And when we believe in the certainty of the blessing, our faith will help us to persevere. See, a lot of times we, we think that sometimes that God's against us. He's not for us. You know, especially when it's our, our circumstances are maybe not going the way we think they should go, right? Maybe we, our, our finances are not like they should, or we lost a job, or we've got family members that are, that, are, that are astray, or we're having strife in our family, or our marriages, or whatever might be happening. We, we base a lot of times God's favor in our lives on our circumstances that we see around us, right? So if everything's going really good in life, and you say, man, God is really happy with me. I'm doing so good, you know, and, and anytime there's nothing going on, we think, oh man, God is sure happy with me. I'm doing so good. But as soon as the devil comes knocking at the door and disarray starts happening in your life, then you think, instead of thinking, oh, the devil's attacked me, a lot of times you think, well, God's not pleased with me. And then you start trying to figure it out. Well, what did I do? Lord, what did I do? But see, I want you to understand something about God. God is not like men, Okay. He doesn't operate on the same thing like we operate, right? We, we have grudges. We do things, you know. We, we, sometimes we tell the truth. Sometimes we don't. I know that's a terrible thing to say, but, but sometimes men lie. You know, things happen. But God doesn't lie. God is always truthful. God is always faithful. God is always reliable. God made a promise to Abraham, and God will fulfill his promise, not only to Abraham, but to all of his seed, to all the heirs. That's something that we can absolutely count upon that God's blessing is going to be in our lives. Somehow, some way, even in the midst of uncertainty, even in the midst of, of where it's... See, and that's, the, that's called faith. Okay? See, a lot of folks, they know all about God and they have no faith. As soon as something bad happens, faith goes out the window. <laughs> it's like my old buddy... And I know I've told you this story before, but after five years, I'm running out of stories. So, so you're going to have to get, get, get a repeat here, okay? <laughs> right? Right? But it's like my old buddy, you know, faith. Faith, if you, if you use faith, man, it's a powerful and a mighty thing. If you believe the promises of God, then even in the midst of the, the storm, why you know that, look, God's blessings coming through this. Somehow, some way, God is going to use this. Well, see, when we used to work up on the roofs in Pennsylvania, why... The wintertime was kind of treacherous because we had something up there. Unlike this, this uh, wet uh, Christmas we're having here, we had white Christmases there, and they usually started about October. And so when you got on the roof and it got slick, there was some snow up there. I'm here to tell you, if you didn't sweep the roof off good, you were going off the roof. Well, we were up working on the roof, and my buddy looked at me, and I looked at him, and he had him a straight claw hammer, and I had a curved claw hammer. And he said, son, he said, that won't never work. And I said, well, what's wrong, Jerry? What's wrong with my hammer? He said, you got a curved claw hammer. I said, well, I don't understand. You got a straight claw, you got a curved claw, big deal, you know. What's the problem? He said, well, no, you don't understand. He said, when, when, when you start sliding down this roof, if you start slipping, man, you take that straight claw hammer, you just dig it in. And it'll stop you right there. And I said, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. I said, well, I, I reckon I need to get me a straight claw hammer, too. Well, as we worked later that day, and it was kind of slick up there a little bit. Next thing I know, I see Jerry turn around and start sliding down the roof. And you know what he did with his hammer? <laughs> he just let it loose. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, that did you a lot of good, didn't it? <laughs> Straight claw, curved claw, no claw. Didn't matter. Praise God, he stopped before he went off the edge. But that's like faith, folks. Most of the time when something terrible happens, the first thing we do, instead of holding on stronger to our faith, we just let it go. God's made incredible promises. And we need to understand that we are part of this blessing that he promised to Abraham. And he tells us that. It says, 
in there as we read this down a little more. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. So God swore by himself that surely blessing I will bless you, multiplying I will multiply you. And then it says in 15, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. I want you to think about this for just a second. After he patiently endured, he obtained the promise. What was Abraham promised? A son, right? Right? He was promised a son. I mean, because God told him, look, you're going to have descendants. Uh, just you won't be able to count them. You look at the stars. You're going to have more descendants than that. It's going to be absolutely awesome. So he promised him a son. Well, what happened the first time through? Well, Sarah decided that she was going to help God out, right? So they, they had, had a child um, by his handmaiden or whatever, Hagar, that was named Ishmael, okay? And that's a whole other sermon because, see, here's the thing. If you, <laughs> if you, if you shortchange and, and you don't do the, work, the will of God, then what you get is Ishmael's and not Isaac's, okay? So see, you have to do the will of God. When God gives you a promise, you can't just do it any old way you want to, okay? You've got to do the will of God. Otherwise, what you get is Ishmael and not Isaac, the child of promise, okay? So Isaac was the child of promise. They received the child of promise. And that was an incredible thing. And you know, they had to be just rejoicing and everything. But what did God ask Abraham to do with Isaac? sacrifice him right I mean they loaded up and, and took their, their donkey or whatever and, and all their stuff and they went to the mount and, and, and even Isaac kind of noticed look there's something going on here we got firewood we got all kind of stuff but we don't have a sacrifice well that's because he was the sacrifice right now I want you to think about this for a second I want you to think about this now, now God had promised him surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you the only way that he is going to be multiplied is through Isaac that's the only way. That's the only way this is going to happen. But now God has asked him to sacrifice his child. Wow. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? That's the child of promise. That's, that's him. He's the one. Yet God asked him to sacrifice him on the altar. I mean, now, now I want you to, to notice something. Here, here's, here's something in, impressive about this. Is that a lot of times God wants to see, you know, how, how serious are we? How, how much do we really love him? How, I mean, if he calls us to obedience, remember, I mean, you know, that we, we need to be obedient. And, and how, how, how much do we trust God? Because I want you to think about the mindset of Isaac or the mindset of Abraham for a second. I mean, I, and then this is what I think his mindset was. God asked him to sacrifice his son. So what I think that Isaac, or Abraham thought was that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Right? I mean, he was absolutely, Abraham may have been one of the first ones to believe in, 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 in life after death and all these things that, that, that God was going to be able to resurrect his child. That he says, oh man, you, this is the child of promise. He's the one that the promises are going to be fulfilled through. Then he is going to have to be raised from the dead if I have to sacrifice him. But notice that he didn't actually have to offer the sacrifice. Right? I mean, he got right there to the very edge, right there to the very, you know, the last, the last second. And then there was a ram in the thicket that God had provided the sacrifice for us. I want you to understand something, that blessing came through obedience. All right? See, blessing comes through obedience. When churches are not preached to be obedient, you got a mess. you got to be obedient to God. If nothing else, you have got to be obedient if it's in the Word of God, if it's something that God's calling you to, and it's here, and you're not going against God's Word, then you've got to be obedient. He was obedient. It's amazing that God would ask such a thing of a man. But then again, Abraham was a great man of faith. And uh, I want you to think about this for a second. I read in one commentary that it says that there are 14 million direct descendants or whatever 
of Abraham living in the world today. Living. So that's not, that's not all the ones that came before them. 14 million, okay? It's a whole bunch. I mean, through that, through that one line there, you know. Here's the thing, and, and I want to show you this for just a second. He said, after he had patiently endured. See, Abraham had to patiently endure this, this trial. He had to patiently go that. But once he, once he endured and he went through that, he obtained the promise that God was giving him. Remember, God's delays in our life are not denials. All right, sometimes God's going to delay something in your life. You may be praying like crazy that, you, that, that God do this or that or, or that, that you believe that God told you that he's going to do this or that. And you're just, you're just like, Lord, you know, you told me you're going to do it. Well, just because he's delayed, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. A delay is not a denial. You know, God can answer us really in three ways a lot of times. A lot of times when we're praying, he's going to tell you yes, absolutely. He might also tell you no. That's a hard one when he says no. Because we don't ever like to hear no. Nobody likes to hear no. But sometimes it's wait. Or not yet. Okay? Just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean that it's not coming. You just have to hang in there. You got to hang on to the promise. It tells us in, in verse 16, it says, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is... For them, an end of all dispute. So anytime they swear by something, they swear by something greater than themselves. Right? When you go to court, what do you swear on? A Bible, right? That's something that's absolutely greater than each one of us, the Word of God. You know, some people could swear by God or whatever it is. Now, notice who God swore by when he made this, this oath or, or this, this uh, promise to, to Abraham. He swore by who? Himself. Why would he swear by himself? There ain't nothing greater than God. He, he's it. He can't swear by anything else. There's nothing else. There's nothing greater than God. Man swears by things because we can find something that's greater than us. But God is it. So he swore by himself. Did you think about some of these things, you know, some of these oaths that we take. We, we swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth sometimes, right, in, in a courtroom. Um, we also take other oaths, some other oaths that we take um, in a wedding, right, for richer or for poorer, for better and worse, sickness and in health, right, till death do us part. And we try to hang on to those promises. I mean, there's things that we, we take very seriously that we, we do swear upon, you know, and and. And I think God takes that stuff serious too. That he, he takes those things seriously that we have sworn to do. But even today in, in our country, why some things seem to be losing their um, value. The Word of God. A lot of people say it's just a book or whatever. Um, you know, it's, it, it's marriage is kind of one of them things worse. It's, it's not as it used to be. All kinds of things in this country are changing. People don't... The, the whole mindset of, of the country has changed. Okay? In my lifetime, the 51 years I've been here, and actually if you go back just a little bit further, it has absolutely changed. And I don't know when it happened or what happened. It's kind of like the, you know, where, where the Bible says that, that the enemy was out sowing tares in the wheat. And they both come up together and, you know, you don't know which is which and you can't really pull them out because you might destroy the wheat to get the tares. Something happened. Somebody sowed tares in this country. I mean, regardless of your, your, uh, your, your politics or whatever, a man named JFK, way back when, asked a question. He said, ask not what your country can do for you. But ask what you can do for your country. You guys remember, I know a lot of you were alive, probably even heard it um, way back when. You know, watched it on TV. Uh, now in our country, it's ask not what you can do for your country, but ask what your country can do for you. 
See, we've totally flipped it around. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna beat up lawyers or anything, because because you know everybody needs profession and there's no nothing wrong with lawyers. But something changed when they started allowing them to advertise on TV. All of a sudden, every time that anybody slipped, uh, fell, any doctor made an honest mistake or anything that took place, there was somebody waiting to either mail you. See, I can always tell when my kids get in trouble. (laughs) Praise God for that, that part, okay? Because I always know when they get in trouble. Because within about three days, I go to the mailbox and I have 37 letters, you know, for lawyers that represent folks for traffic tickets or this or that or whatever. And then I start going down the line. Jackson, did you get a ticket? You know, (laughs) Dennis, did you get a ticket? Alec, did you get a ticket? Somebody got a ticket. I don't ever ask Gina because, you know, but, but anyways, because she doesn't get tickets. But, but, I mean, somebody got a ticket. So I'm getting a mailbox full of these things. But that's the nature of our society now. We, we're not about the country anymore. We're about individuals. We're becoming more and more and more individualistic. And see, and that's not just in the country. That's crept in to the church. The people now, and, and gosh, that's not even on the paper, but you're fixing to get a little bit of What kills me about people in churches is they go looking for the perfect church. They want a church that has the perfect youth ministry. They want a church that has the perfect singles ministry. They want to have a church that has the perfect music ministry, the perfect pastor. And a pastor that's funny and good looking and possibly young and wise all at the same time. I love it. I love it. I love it. But the thing is, is that we shop churches like we're going on to the mall to find the cheapest dress or the cheapest pair of pants or the ones that you like the best. And that cheapens the church. People are not committed to their church. They're committed to what, which church can fulfill my desires or my needs the best. And if that church doesn't fulfill it, I'm out the door and I'm going to find one that will. Right? And I'm not, I'm not throwing stones. I live in glass house too. But I'm just saying that everybody all the time, they're looking for something that, whether it exists or not, how about we do this? How about we join a church and we do it like we're supposed to do marriage? For richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, till death do his part. Wouldn't that be impressive if people joined the church and said, man, you know what? We may have good preachers. We may have bad preachers. But I'm staying through them because I know that's my church. We may have great Sunday school teachers. We may not have great. We may have great music. We may have terrible music. We may not have the best facility. We may have the greatest facility. But whatever we've got, God's given us. And he's planted me there. And by God, I'm staying put. I mean, that's the kind of, that's the kind of mindset that we need. See, the, we, so many times we, we're, we're chasing something, first of all, that doesn't exist. You know, there's a dream out there. There's, a, there's something that's like the, the perfect whatever, and I hate to tell you, but it doesn't exist. If you're looking for the perfect husband, you'll never find him. If you're looking for the perfect wife, you'll never find her either because there, there are no perfect people. There's no perfect marriages. There's no perfect children. There's no perfect jobs. There's no perfect anything in this world. It's fallen. Way back when. And we need to start hanging on to what God does in our lives and and where he puts us. We we need to to, to be men and women of our word. Right? Let our yes be yes and let our no be no. Real simple. Not double-minded, not this, that, and the other. Just, Just be like that. All right, now that we've chased that rabbit, I, I think I killed him and skinned him. So we're going to go ahead and, and go on. Verse 17, thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immut- immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by the Im- two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. We can absolutely believe that God doesn't lie. And that's something that you can, you can put that up there. 
I mean, that's something. God does not lie. Not only God doesn't lie, God cannot lie. People lie sometimes. God never lies. There's no surer promise in this world than an oath given by God Almighty. And how sure can we be of the promises that God has given us? Because He gave an oath. He swore by Himself. He said, look, I can't swear by anything higher than myself, so I'm going to swear by myself that I will keep this promise to you that I will bless you and multiply, and I'm going to multiply you, that these things are going to happen. I'm going to give you this promise, and I'm going to promise, and I'm going to give my oath. We can have no doubt in what God says. It's the truth. It's the truth. He gave us two things, his promise and his oath. That's the thing about God. All things are possible with God, but he cannot lie, right? He can't go against his, his character. He can't go against who he is. And, and the thing is, is that we can take refuge in God, knowing that his promises are true. We can flee to Jesus for refuge. How many times have we, have we, have we needed somewhere or something and we felt like we just needed to be able to, to get away from all of this for a little bit or, or get away from that or whatever it is where we felt like we just needed peace, you know, peace like a river to where we, we just needed it so where we could just absolutely get away from things. The Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to be a refuge for the believer. You understand what I'm saying? He's your refuge. He's your high tower. He's your place of hiding. He, he's that place that you can go to where the whole world can be out there ripping and rearing. And you can get in Christ and just be in the, the refuge of God. And there's times where we need the refuge. And the, and the beautiful thing is that we can take refuge in God knowing that His promises are true. That everything that He tells us is true. That we can read the Word of God and know that it's true beyond a shadow of a doubt. Amen. Verse 19, I love this. It says, This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. I want you to think about this for a second. The anchor. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Our anchor. Lord Jesus Christ is our anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. I mean, he's, he's the rock. He's the one that we can hang on to. See, there's so many things in this world that are changing. A lot of things are like shifting sand. We never know what's going to happen one way or the other. But Jesus, he's the anchor. For our soul, we got to hang on to them, church. So many folks, they, they, have, they know all the belief. They've got all the head knowledge, but they don't have the heart to hang on. I want you to think about anchors for a second. I've been out, I've been out fishing before. Me and Robert, we've gone out a few times. Robert always caught all the fish. I just brought back stories. But, uh. There was times where we needed to set the anchor. And you chunk that anchor off the boat. The beautiful thing about an anchor is that if you can get it set, it'll hold. I don't care how hard the current's flowing or what's going on. If that anchor's set, it will, it will hang on and it will hold. Can I tell you something about the anchor, though? When we were in the strongest waters, the strongest currents, to where I just didn't even know that it, that it might hold or not, and it was holding fast and firm, is that I couldn't see the anchor. I mean, I could look in that water. I could see the rope going down. I know the anchor was there. I mean, I could see the rope tight, and it was pulling. And I knew that the current was really strong, and it was trying to pull the boat. And, but I couldn't see the anchor, but the anchor was holding. Church, I'm telling you, there's times where you can't see the anchor. But I'm telling you, if you'll hang on to Jesus, it will hold. But you got to hang on. you got to hang on. Sometimes I ask God, you know, Lord, why have, I, why have you allowed some of these trials and tribulations and, 
and, and heartbreak and angry, anguish and, and things come into my life. And, and, and most of the time, you know what he told me? So that you'd know that the anchor will hold. You know, we got we to gotta make sure that we're hanging on. Church, we gotta we gotta make sure that we have we have faith. It, it, we have a, this hope as an anchor of the soul that the promises of God are true, sure and steadfast. I want you to think about this. It says, "And which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek." Jesus has become the high priest. He entered the sanctuary behind the veil in the temple. I want you to I want to explain this just a little bit. Because if you don't understand what the temple's like, you won't understand what the significance of the veil is, okay? See, there was a holy place where the priests all ministered and everything, but then you would go behind the veil was the holy of holies. That was the holiest place. That was the place where they believed that the ark was there and, and, the, and, the, and God's presence dwelt between the cherubim on the ark that he was there and the thing was is nobody went in there except for the high priest one time a year the high priest himself first of all he would have to sacrifice for his sin to make sure that he had no unconfessed sin in his life or his family's life and then he could go in and take the blood and sprinkle it before that holy place they had bells on his garments so that when, when he was in there ministering, they could hear the bells ringing. They had a rope tied to him that if God would strike him down because he went in there with sin. See, that's the thing about sin, folks. You don't understand. Sin leads to death. Grace is life, but sin is death. If you offer profane fire before God, you will be burned up. That high priest would go in there Sprinkle that blood for the atonement of the sins of the people. But he could only go in one time a year. Once a year he would go in behind that veil. And he would come out. Jesus has become the high priest. And I want you to think about that for a second. That he, he went in there. Hallelujah. And, and see they, they called the, that, that place in there the mercy seat of God. But see when Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary. The mercy seat was moved. From the Holy of Holies where only one person saw it one time a year to that cross on Calvary where mankind could see the mercy seat of God. Amen. When you see a cross, you're seeing the mercy seat. That's the mercy seat of God right there. Run to the cross. Jesus became the high priest. He entered the sanctuary behind the veil. But he's not a priest of Aaron. Understand, it says he's a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The priests of Aaron, they could only serve for a lifetime. When they died, they were no longer a priest. The priest of Melchizedek was an eternal order. He served forever. And I'm not going to get too deep into Melchizedek. That's chapter 7. And I don't want to get too far in there. But let's just go ahead and, and finish up with this. The priests of Aaron, they entered the Holy of Holies by themselves. They walked in by themselves. They came in alone. They could take no one with them. But Jesus, the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, he brings us all with him into the Holy of Holies. I mean, you want to talk about a priesthood? Which one's more superior, the priesthood of Aaron or the priesthood of Melchizedek fulfilled through Jesus the Messiah? Woo! Man, Aaron couldn't go in. The priest of Aaron could only go in by himself, but Jesus takes us all into the Holy of Holies. He brings us with him. He's the captain of our salvation. He brings believers with him into the Holy of Holies. We have access now. The veil has been torn. The beautiful thing about it is it was torn from top to bottom. There was no human hands that tore that veil. That was God that tore it. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you folks. We have a high priest. His name is Jesus Christ. 
He is the Messiah. He is the one from the, from the eternal priesthood. He's the one that's eternally ministering every day, day in and day out. He's ministering for us. Every day, he sits at the right hand of the Father God, interceding for each and every one of us. And when the evil one comes up with accusations against you, they said, no, that one's mine. I'm standing. That's our Jesus. When we place our lives under the blood of Jesus, he is our high priest. He's the one that stands in for us. He's the one that took all our sins to the cross. He's the one that, that we got forgiveness through. That not only we were forgiven and set free, but that we'll have eternal life through him. That there'll come a day when we leave this world. A lot of folks are scared to die. I'm here to tell you, if you're a Christian, you don't need to be afraid of death. All you're going to do is step from one side to the other, and you will be with Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. To be absent from the body is to be present with him. We're going to be there in heaven. We're going to walk the streets of gold. We're going to see that mansion that's prepared for us. We're going to see those loved ones that have gone before us. That's what Jesus can do for us. We have a risen Savior, one who died and was raised from the dead. On the third day, he was raised again. Last I knew, Muhammad was dead. Last I knew, Buddha was dead. They're all dead. But my Jesus, he lives. Amen. He lives. That's who you serve, church. That's who you serve. Let's close tonight with that. I'm telling you, man. You, whew, man, ain't no better time of the year is there Christmas. We celebrate the birth of that one named Jesus. That one that was fully man and fully God. That one that took the sins of the world upon him. He was without sin all his life. Born of a virgin. Oh, my goodness. And went to the cross for the redemption of our sins. If you all stand with me tonight as we close. As I preach Sunday, please make room for Jesus in this holiday. Make room for Him. Make room for your Savior. He's the one. He's the reason why we celebrate this season. We call it Christmas. We've named it after the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Make room for him this year. Start yourself a new start a new way of doing Christmas this year. If you don't read the Christmas story, take time. Just stop for like five minutes and say, look, y'all, I, I know we, we're fixing to tear presents open. We're going to look like a bunch of Wolverines in here in a second, ripping these bows and wrappers and stuff flying everywhere. But stop for five minutes and read the Word of God to your family, to your children, to your grandchildren, to whoever's around you. Read the Word of God to them and say, look, you know, we're having fun and we like the lights and the bows and, and the trees and all that stuff. But this was about a babe that was born 2,000 years ago. And they didn't have no room in it for, the, for him in the inn. So they stuck him in an old, old stable and wrapped him in cloths and put him in a manger because there was no room. But I want us to start a new tradition in our homes. You know, read the Christmas story over your children, over your grandchildren. Let them realize and know what the real meaning is in the season. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you don't teach them, nobody will. The world's going to teach them the other version. They'll never get the gospel. So let's close tonight in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you are so wonderful. Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus, into this world. Because you loved us. Your word says you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son. 
that whosoever should believe. And Lord, we know those whosoever's are us. That we'd not perish, but have eternal life. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for the gift that you gave your son, Jesus, to this world. That we might be reconciled to you. And Lord, we thank you that you sit at the right hand of the Father, interceding for the church, interceding for each one of us. Lord, that as your, as your Holy Spirit takes our prayer up from where we're at here and brings it to heaven. Lord Jesus, you intercede for us. You speak to the Father on our behalf. God, we thank you for that tonight. So, Lord, we just ask that you would be with us. Be ever near and close, Lord, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. That we not forget the reason why we celebrate. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless y'all.